Welcome to a video version of the Lord's Day service for September 12th, 2021. I'll start by reading some scripture. A reading from Psalm 19. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than they are than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping with them is a great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insult, insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Our second reading is from the book of James. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. If we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity, it stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and it itself is on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse those who, made, who are made in the likeness of God. From the small mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought to be not, not be so. Does a, spring, does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives? or a grapevine figs. No more can salt water yield fresh. Our gospel reading is from Mark. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? They answered him, John the Baptist, others said Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anybody about him. Then he began to teach and tell them that the Son of Man must undergo, undergo great suffering to be rejected by elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things but on human things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One little word shall fell him. In the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, these words ring out, and Satan's craft and power are great. 
and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal, and yet one little word causes him to fall. Even though Martin Luther's famous hymn is filled with dark images of devils and Satan, it's oddly comforting. Now, I'm not much into triumphant warrior Jesus lyrics. In fact, I've kind of pushed against them a little bit, and sometimes they're just plain bad. But I can't shake this one. I can't shake this hymn. One of my pastor's friend, pastor friends down in Portland told me, don't be so judgmental, Rob. She said, sometimes we need Jesus to be just who we need Jesus to be. Sometimes we need that triumphant warrior Jesus. But instead of wielding swords and shields, it's just one little word that Jesus has as the weapon. Indeed, it's true. Words can start wars. And words can bring reconciliation. Now, we humans are a chatty species. And sometimes I wonder, what would it be like if uh, a Jane Goodall from another planet came to study us with her notebook and with her, her National Geographic cameras? All this ceaseless chatter that we do, it's really quite amazing, isn't it? We chat, 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 and then things start happening. How can all these people talk so much and then still get stuff done? What seems like them empty chatter to us, though, is in fact bonding. It's sizing each other up, you know, looking and seeing the landscape and who is doing what, who's on top, who's not. We agree by talking. We reject. We figure things out. We make sense of the world. Fundamentally, all of this is organizing. And we seem biologically hardwired to organize. Have you ever watched eight-year-olds play? Inevitably, they fight over rules. In fact, they seem to fight over rules more than they actually do the game or play. I don't know what it is about eight-year-olds, but that seems to be that period of life when they do that. But it turns out that's the way we work together through these rules. A few months ago, I read a book called Humankind, a hopeful history by Dutch author Rutger Bregman. He describes how humans cooperate and get along far better and far more often than we think they do. We are so consumed with problems and pessimism that we ignore how frequently things actually go right in human society rather than wrong. We have convinced ourselves of the fallacy that we are merely brutes covered with a thin veneer, thin veneer of civilization. Bregman uses the example of the Lord of the Flies, the novel, The Lord of the Flies, as an example of this fallacy. Now, the novel, which uh, describes a brutish uh, encounter with kids uh, shipwrecked in the South Pacific, actually has no basis in fact. And we all, but we've all seen Many of us, at least, have seemed to have been had this novel pushed on us in high school. Bregman showed that there what went that there is actually a real life scenario of kids being shipwrecked in the South Pacific about sixty years ago or so, and those kids ended up doing the exact opposite of the novel. They organized. They developed leadership. They created rules and laws, and they punished those who did not comply, but they also showed mercy and let them back into their small society. Ultimately, this group of kids thrived. 
when they found them eventually, they were doing pretty well. There are numerous examples of this kind of self-organization in history and social science largely supports this, but pessimism and a low view of humanity abounds in popular culture. We keep going back to disaster scenarios and the uh, many atrocities of humanity, but it seems that pessimism and self-critique might be a survival skill. Fear in herds is a key feature in the natural world. It's, it is like the constant vigilance of prey animals like you know, deer or, uh, or, or rabbits or other animals like this in, in, uh, in the wild. Now the chances of any individual being picked off, especially like deer, larger animals, is actually quite small but it's the fear of the herd that protects them. I wonder if holding a defensively low view of humanity is kind of like that uh, herd mentality. It is a thing that a cosmic Jane Goodall would record in her journal about us, especially now that we have cable news and social media to juice up the fear to a fever pitch. What sets us apart though as humans are words. The law is language. The law is composed of words used to self-organize. In the form you see in the Bible, the law is protection. It's what allows us to thrive. This is why Psalm 19 is so beautiful. Instead of the law being restrictive, it's actually liberating. The kingdom of God is essentially wherever the law is loved. The precepts of the Lord are to be desired more than gold, much fine gold, because it is beautiful. It's sweeter than honey to the righteous because it brings nourishment and comfort. For this reason, I hold a high view of humanity. And I think the God that we read about in the Psalms does too. The idea of original sin and penal substitutionary atonement, this idea that has been drilled into us our whole lives, just doesn't make sense to me. I don't think that the, it really is in the Bible even though it's been drilled to, into us. Now, I do believe in sin. And I do believe that all people, every one of us, no matter where we are in the world, are in need of redemption and reconciliation, for sure. It's just part of being human. But the Jonathan Edwards idea of sinners in the hands of an angry God, the idea of an angry father God dangling people over the pits of hell is much more about controlling people and justifying slavery and not about bringing about the grace of God to humanity. I realize this can be controversial and it's really so rooted in who we are that it can cause a lot of challenges for people. And I'm happy to talk about that with you if it makes you feel uncomfortable. And I would love to hear back from you about your thoughts on this. But I think it's this idea has done tremendous damage to the image of God in the name of nationalism and domination. And I really hope we move beyond it. Because the law of God is uplifting and beautiful. Moses brought together, brought order to tribalism of the Israelites through the law. Asylum cities are a great example of this. You read about this in, uh, in uh, Joshua. You read about it in the Pentateuch and Deuteronomy about this idea of cities where people could, murderers could go and they wouldn't be prosecuted. 
there are other examples of people who sinned and they go and they grab the, the horns of the altar at the temple and they're, they have amnesty. And you go, well, maybe that isn't fair. How do you have a society that allows this kind of amnesty, even for murderers? Well, it was to stop blood revenge and to stop endless feuds, which were a great problem in this era. Forgiveness and amnesty are gifts from God. Truth and reconciliation are gifts from God. And this is why people like Nelson Mandela and why Martin Luther King Jr. should be in the top of pantheon of peacemakers. They did not retaliate in spite of the terrible injustices done to them. This is why Muhammad is so revered by Muslims. We in the West have a negative view of Muhammad, not understanding his culture, and that Muhammad actually brought peace to tribes that were in constant warfare. He brought a society riven with blood revenge in the, in the Arabian Peninsula to peace, and they thrived. Now, in James, we are told about the power of the tongue. We know this in our daily lives. How often have we seen a harsh word devastate a child or a person in pain? When have we seen a kind word and a sincere I love you make all the difference in a relationship? My heart is continually warmed by the kindness and gentleness of words that is in the culture of this church and in you as a congregation. It's such a gift. It's a gift we should celebrate. It's a gift of the spirit that's here. So when you see it this way, it makes sense that God's precepts are lovely and beautiful to be desired more than gold, sweeter than honey, because they describe a high view of humanity honoring our fellow humans with dignity. Then we can see our fellow humans with love and kindness in the image of God. Let us pray. Loving God, it's so easy to be discouraged by all the difficulties of life and the unkind behavior of people around us. We know that words matter, even small words. Because even one small word can fell the enemy. Let us see the beauty of your precepts. For your words are finer than gold. Sweeter than honey. Open our hearts to the spirit. So that we can see our fellow humans as beautiful creatures in your image. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.